Let me uh, first uh, say I want to thank Chairwoman Waters and Ranking Member McHenry and my colleagues and Mr. Luca Mayo, who is the Ranking Member of this subcommittee, and all my other colleagues for your participation in today's roundtable discussion entitled Update from Prudential Regulators. This is a timely discussion as we engage with the nation's prudential regulators amid the health care and economic devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic. The borough of Queens and other parts of New York City have been very hard hit. Queens has suffered more cases and more deaths than most states in the country. Amid this health care crisis, millions have lost their jobs and source of income, compounding the economic impact. But thanks to the Dodd-Frank Wall Street reforms and their implementation in the decade that followed the financial crisis, the nation's banking sector has emerged as a relatively bright spot with adequate capital to buffer the initial impact of the crisis and work with clients to restructure mortgages and loans and extend credit. But I have had serious concerns about the implementation of the PPP stimulus program and the role some of the banks played in prioritizing loans for large listed companies rather than small businesses and minority communities. But thanks to the hard work of Chairwoman Waters and Chairwoman Velasquez, the PPP program uh, seems to appear uh, seems to have many things addressed uh, in, in, this, in the latest installment. And I have concerns also, though, how long the nation's banks and credit unions can endure the current crises. If it lasts into the fall or even into next year, and the capacity of the smallest banks, minority banks, and CDFIs to overcome the challenges of this crisis. I hope to hear from the NCUA about the taxi medallion loans portfolio that it sold off over the objections of the New York delegation, and I will, and which I fear will make it harder to bring relief to impacted New York City taxi drivers who are already reeling from the pandemic. It is my pleasure now to uh, yield to Mr. Luca Meyer to offer some introductory remarks. Thank you, uh, Greg. And uh, first, I'd like to thank the attendees for being here today and for your tireless efforts over the last few months to help Amer the American people respond to the COVID-19 crisis. While today's roundtable is not a legislative hearing, it is my hope that we can have a meaningful discussion on the steps regulators have taken to date and examine what further steps must be taken to ensure the health of the American economy. Congress and administration have taken drastic measures in responding to both the health and economic crisis coronavirus has presented. Congress has passed four legislative packages that have delivered much needed re, uh, funding to hospitals and healthcare providers, state and local governments, small business, and importantly, the American people. In addition, the CARES Act con contained numerous provisions to eliminate unnecessary burdens on financial institutions, allowing them to better serve their customers. To date, regulators have been providing some needed forbearance and flexibility to financial institutions and liquidity directly to borrowers and investors in key credit markets. In particular, the TDR provision contained in the CARES Act has allowed institutions to work with their customers and restructure their loans without the negative TDR accounting classification. In addition, the regulators have stated they will not be punitive toward financial institutions for working with their customers. Despite this progress, I remain concerned about how regulators will treat assets that have been impaired by coronavirus. While the CARES Act provides relief until the end of the year, or the end of the emergency declaration, it's clear many industries will continue to struggle as consumers and businesses adjust to the new economic climate. Regulators should look at additional accounting and examination relief for assets impaired by coronavirus. Specifically, for a period of two years, examiners should provide, in my judgment, deference to all, uh, on all loans and leases impaired by coronavirus, and those loans should be exempt from certain negative accounting classifications. I'm working on a bill that will do just that. This will allow institutions the certainty they need to work with their customers and get them back to economic help. It is vital that you, the regulators, work with financial institutions to ensure they can provide their customers with the necessary forbearance to get through this crisis. I look forward to discussing many and this list of many other issues with you. With you, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luca Meyer. I now like to acknowledge the chairwoman of this great financial services committee. Chairwoman Maxine Waters for her introductory remarks. Thank you, Chairman Meeks. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first Financial Services Committee virtual roundtable. I'd like to thank Ranking Member McHenry, 
for working with me on these virtual roundtables. <clears throat> As the nation faces this pandemic crisis, in which 1.3 million Americans have been infected with COVID-19, and more than 78,000 Americans have lost their lives, it is imperative that Congress and our regulators and Congress respond with unyielding focus and energy to help those who are struggling. Yesterday, Speaker Pelosi introduced the HEROES Act to provide an additional $3 trillion in needed relief, including to renters, homeowners, consumers, and small businesses. Our financial regulators must do their part and encourage financial institutions to help their customers and must not undermine our system's resiliency or weaken protections for consumers, small businesses, and communities of color. Any rule makers unrelated to COVID-19 should be halted. We all must take action to respond to this crisis and help those in harm's way, but it is not acceptable to use this crisis as an excuse for financial deregulation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I now recognize Mr. McHenry, the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee, for his uh, introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Meeks um, and Ranking Member Lukemeyer. I uh, want to thank uh, Chairwoman Waters um, and her staff uh, for the work that they put in to bringing out these virtual roundtables in such a professional and thoughtful way. And um, I hope that this can be a model for the rest of Congress on how we can collect information for our policymaking and get proper inputs given the nature of the virus that we're, we're all so thoughtfully trying to social distance and, and, and deal with the consequences of. So uh, thank you, Chairwoman Waters, and thank you uh, to the Democrat staff and to the Republican staff who worked so well together to achieve this bipartisan outcome. To the panelists, thank you for taking your time. I know it's uh, quite crucial that you stay focused on the task at hand. And given the global health crisis, it's become an economic crisis. It's, it's of our interest to ensure that it doesn't morph into any other form of crisis. So to that end, I think it's important that you all stay focused on your job of following through on the agenda that you set forward for our financial industry and to ensure that they're properly regulated and that we address regulations that are ill-fitting to the current crisis uh, that we face economically. And let's ensure that uh, that level-headedness in working through this crisis and working with Congress is continued. So thank you for taking time. Thank you for the work you're doing. And I hope you'll continue to take an aggressive look at regulations that don't uh, fit to the current challenges that we are facing as a country. And with that, I yield back. All right, I, I, my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, I would now like to welcome our panelists and thank each of them for joining us today. First, I'd like to welcome the Honorable Rodney E. Hood, Chairman of the National Credit Union Administration. Mr. Hood was sworn into office on April 8, 2019, as is the 11th NCUA Chairman. As NCUA Board Chairman, Mr. Hood also serves as a voting member of the Financial Stability Oversight Council. He also represents the NCUA on the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council and the Financial and Banking Information Infrastructure Committee. Immediately prior to joining the NCUA Board, Mr. Hood served as a Corporate Responsibility Manager for J.P. Morgan Chase, managing national partnerships with nonprofit organizations and financial regulators, and community stakeholders to promote financial inclusion and shared prosperity in underserved communities throughout the United States. His previous experience includes serving as Associate Administrator of the Rural Housing Service at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In this role, he helped to address the housing needs in, of rural communities and administered the agency's $43 billion mortgage portfolio. Mr. Hood, you're now recognized for your introductory remarks. Chair Meeks, Ranking Member Luke Tamayer. Chair Roman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the NCRA's efforts to maintain a safe and sound credit union system during the rapidly evolving COVID-19 emergency. 
the NCUA has swiftly implemented the CARES Act's provisions affecting federally insured credit unions. The NCUA board expanded access to the central liquidity facility, which helped the credit union system successfully navigate the last financial crisis and may prove vital in addressing potential liquidity needs of credit unions and the share insurance fund. The NCUA is also working with the SBA to provide credit unions with guidance and resources so they can fully participate in the Paycheck Protection Program. Last week, I spoke with an MDI credit union in Mississippi that made 1,000 PPP loans with an average of $13,000 to businesses that serve low to moderate income and minority communities, including one to one of the nation's oldest black colleges. This is just one example that epitomizes the credit union ethos of people helping people during this difficult time. I'm pleased that Congress provided in the CARES Act temporary relief from the implementation of the CISO methodology. I share your concerns that adopting and implementing CISO will place an undue burden on credit unions and have a chilling effect on future lending. That is why I've encouraged the FASB to consider providing credit unions a permanent exemption from CISO. The NCUA board is providing appropriate measures of regulatory relief to ensure that credit unions are operational and liquid so they can continue to serve their 120 million member owners. For nearly a century, credit unions supported the taxi industry in New York City. The NCUA completed the sale of a majority of its taxi medallion loan portfolio in February to a buyer with a demonstrated history of working proactively with borrowers. The action strikes the balance between minimizing additional losses to the share insurance fund, protecting borrowers, and reducing market volatility. In conclusion, the NCUA has responded decisively to the needs of credit unions during the pandemic and is fulfilling its critical mission of protecting the safety and soundness of the 5,236 credit unions that we oversee. I would like to thank the NCUA's 1,141 employees for their unwavering dedication and fidelity to our agency's mission. Each and every day, they put forth their best efforts to protect the nation's system of cooperative credit. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I pray that you, your families, and staff remain healthy and safe. I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Yelena McWilliams, Chairwoman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Ms. McWilliams currently serves as the 21st Chairperson of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Previously, she was the Executive Vice President, Chief Legal Officer, and Corporate Secretary at the Fifth Third Bank in Cincinnati, Ohio. Prior to joining the Fifth Third Bank, Ms. McWilliams worked in the United States Senate for six years, most, recent, most recently as the Chief Counsel and Deputy Staff Director with the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, and previously as Assistant Chief Counsel with the Senate Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee. From 2007 to, two, to 2010, Ms. McWilliams served as an attorney at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Ms. McWilliams, you now have three minutes for your introductory remarks. Thank you very much. Chairman Meek, Ranking Member Lukemeyer, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee and staff, thank you for the opportunity to participate today. I hope that you, your families, and your staff are safe and are able to do nation's work at this time. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the FDIC, FDIC has taken swift, decisive actions to maintain stability and public, public confidence in the nation's financial system. We have taken actions to encourage banks to work with affected customers and communities, increase flexibility for banks to meet the needs of their customers, foster small business lending, protect consumers and increase financial options, and actively monitor the financial system. The brunt of this economic impact is going to fall hardest and fastest on individual consumers, small businesses, independent contractors, low-income borrowers, and hourly workers. As the FDIC encourages banks to take prudent steps to work with customers, we remain particularly mindful of these affected groups and of those in our communities who are most vulnerable both to the pandemic and its ensuing economic shock, our senior citizens, and particularly those on fixed income. As part of our extensive outreach, we have contacted all 50 state banking commissioners, spoken 
to a uh, number of uh, members of Congress, reached out to consumer groups, and maintained regular contact with supervised institutions, particularly community banks. Mm -hmm. These engagements have helped us better understand the particular challenges facing banks and communities across the nation, and particularly in rural communities. While the FDIC does not have many open rulemakings at this time, we continue to focus our efforts on modernizing and improving the efficiency and resiliency of the financial system. We're evaluating on a case-by-case -case basis, pending rulemakings for which the FDIC has sole jurisdiction, and prioritizing rules that are necessary or appropriate at this time and that will not disrupt or add unnecessary uncertainty to the market. We're actively engaged with our fellow regulators as we collectively assess how to proceed on each pending interagency rulemaking. As we respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and continue our vital work, the 6,000 dedicated employees of the FDIC continue to fulfill the agency's critical mission. Our employees are working tirelessly to maintain stability and public confidence in the financial system. I could not be more proud of their efforts and unwavering addition to the mission of the FDIC. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Joseph Otting, Comptroller of the Currency. Mr. Otting was sworn in, in the 31st, as the 31st Comptroller of the Currency on November 27, 2017. As Comptroller, Mr. Otting also serves as a Director of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and a member of the Financial Stability Oversight Council and the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council. Prior to becoming Comptroller of the Currency, Mr. Outing served as President of CIT Bank and Co-President of CIT Group from August 2015 to December 2015. Mr. Outing, you are now recognized for three minutes for your introductory remarks. Thank you very much and hello everybody. Uh, Chairman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, Chairman Meeks and Ranking Member Luca Meyer and members of the subcommittee, Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the OCC support to the nation during this public health emergency. America's national banks and federal savings associations entered this pandemic well equipped for their central role in facilitating the nation's relief programs. Capital and liquidity were strong and asset quality was good. Banks acted quickly from a position of strength to provide relief to their customers and communities and to buoy initiatives such as the Paytech protection program, mortgage forbearance, and foreclosure relief, and lending facilities that provide capital and liquidity so that our economy can continue to operate. Since early March, the OCC has been in regular communication with the 1,200 banks we supervise to encourage them to work with borrowers while we navigate the challenges they face and other emerging issues. We have coordinated closely with other regulators to ensure more than 40 pieces of guidance, rules, and clarify regarding capital, liquidity, accounting, and customer accommodations. These actions help banks to use their strength to support their customers and their communities. In February, the agency also implemented our enhanced market data collection processes to closely monitor the condition of the industry. Agent, agency executives meet daily to discuss issues facing consumers, banks, and the broader financial services industry. This effort has resulted in real-time awareness of the condition of the banks and early identifications of concerns, allowing us to act promptly to promote the orderly flow of credit and banking services. The agency has managed the demands of COVID-19, while nearly 95% of our staff has worked from home. While the nation's plans to return to a more normal, normal environment, the OCC is planning for its employees to return offices and banks across the country. As we make this transition, we will put the health and safety of our employees at the forefront of every decision we make. We will continue to support them as they deal with the COVID-19 challenges. Throughout our work, the OCC continues to support the vibrancy of minority deposit institutions and community development institutions and their customers. MDIs and CDFIs focus their products and services and communities and needs across our company, across our country, where our capital and lending are off scarce and difficult to obtain. Our sustained commitment to these communities includes encouraging banks to document and track the Paytech Protection Program loans made to a small business borrowers located in the moderate and low-income areas. 
The OCC also directly supports MDIs with our advisory committee that provides insight into challenges facing these institutions, hosting collaborative roundtables that help them connect with helpful resources and technology and publishing resources and reference materials and paying special consideration to the needs of these institutions and the rules and the guidance we issue so they may continue to meet their community's unique needs. Thank you again for holding this round table and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. And finally, but not last, last but not least, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Randall Quarles, Vice Chairman for the Supervision of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Mr. Quarles, uh, Mr. Quarles was sworn in as Vice Chair for Supervision on October 13, 2017. As term, as Vice Chair, his term for, as Vice Chair for the Supervision ends on October 13, 2021. Mr. Qualis is also Chair of the Financial Stability Board, FSB, a role he's assumed on December 2nd of 2018 to fill a three-year term, three term. Prior to his appointment to the board, he was founder and managing director of the Kenosha Group, a Utah-based investment firm, and before that, he was a partner at the Carlisle Group. From September 2005 to November, 20, to November 2006, he served as Undersecretary of the U.S. Department of the Treasury for Domestic Finance. Prior to serving as Undersecretary from April 2002 to August 2005, he was Assistant Secretary for the Treasury of International Affairs. And during his tenure there, he served as policy chair of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Prior to joining the Treasury, he served from August 2001 to April 2002 as the U.S. Executive Director for the International Monetary Fund. Mr. Qualis, you may now give your introductory remarks. You have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Meeks. Ranking Member Luke Meyer, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's roundtable. Uh, the last two months have been a time of exceptional economic hardship. The Congress has displayed an extraordinary willingness to address this hardship and its consequences. And I appreciate your dedication to continuing our common work. Last week, the board published a report that reviews the supervisory and regulatory steps that the Federal Reserve has taken to address the challenges of the economic contraction. Today, I'd like to provide you with an overview of our broader approach to supporting the economy, maintaining the supply of credit, and reducing the economic effects of the current crisis. As you know, the containment measures adopted to address the pandemic triggered a deep, abrupt, and global financial shock. The strain was widespread as families and businesses struggled to pay bills, meet expenses, and sustain their daily lives. Over the past decade, Congress, the financial institutions themselves and the regulatory agencies worked to ensure that the banking system would be a source of strength to the economy during a crisis. And as a result of these efforts, financial institutions entered this new crisis in a position of strength. And the Federal Reserve has acted to ensure that they could use this strength to lend to credit worthy firms, absorb new deposits, and process a flood of transactions from investors, businesses, and households. The Federal Reserve's efforts have applied to a range of financial institutions, including both community development financial institutions and minority, and minority depository institutions, both of which are important to financing small business and community development in low and moderate income communities. To name one example, uh, both CFIs and NDIs are eligible to participate in the Paycheck Protection Program Liquidity Facility, which will help small business lending by the firms. Two weeks ago, we expanded the eligibility of the facility to include CBFI loan funds that are eligible lenders for the Paycheck Protection Program. We've conducted outreach uh, to both CBFIs and NDIs to better understand the challenges that they and the communities they serve face in the current crisis and will continue to do so. I'd also like to note that just this morning, the board published its annual report on NDIs. The banking system has shown resilience. The storm is not over. Firms must continue to work constructively with borrowers, offering them flexibility to weather a hardship they could not expect and did not create. And ultimately, the strength of the U.S. financial sector will reflect and depend on the strength of the U.S. economy. And that, in turn, 
will depend on the calibration and effectiveness of our public health response. We at the Federal Reserve are seeking to play our role responsibly and effectively. The tools we have are ones no country should ever hope to need. The hour of their use is one no country should ever look to face. One that we require of us for the current crisis stands. We all know to do what this country can. Thank you for your threat. Well, thank you. And uh, I now will yield to myself for the order of questioning. Uh, and then I'm going to give it, send it back over to committee staff, who will then do the order for member questions. Uh, so I'll start. I know I have three minutes, and so I'll ask each of our panelists to be brief in their response, uh, given that uh, we only have three minutes for questions and answers. And I'll start with Chairwoman McWilliams. Uh, Chairwoman McWilliams, when you were last before this committee, you made a commitment that you would not sign off on any CRA reforms that were not consistent with the law's original intent, including its civil rights roots. Do, you, do we still have your word on this? And also briefly, if you would, I'd like you to focus on minority banks and CDFIs and what you are doing to support them during the crisis. Sure they remain viable. Thank you for that question. Uh, and yes, on the first question, we still have my commitment, uh, and it's an unwavering commitment that has not changed from the last time, and I do not see it changing in the future. On the second question, on the MDIs and CDFIs, uh, we're frankly uh, doing extensive re uh, outreach with the MDIs that are within our jurisdiction. The FDIC is the primary regulator for the MDIs in the country. We have about 144 under our uh, wings and jurisdiction. And so we have done um, uh, calls with our MDIs. We have engaged in uh, a, a teleconference to understand their needs. We have reached out to individual MDIs as well since the pandemic has started. Um, just to understand what's going on in their communities and how can we be of service. Our MDI coordinator, co coordinator has done a number of those calls as well. I have done them personally. And we are uh, committed as ever, if not even more so this time during this pandemic, that our MDIs can survive and continue to help their communities, which I believe are going to be some of the hardest pressed communities by the current crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Qualls. What is the principal risk that you are monitoring that could strain the banking sector if the crisis drags on into the fall or even next year? And is there a risk of another housing collapse as people struggle to pay rent or mortgage? Or could it be a commercial real estate as a growing share of companies collapse as the recession drags on? Um, well, uh, clearly uh, the economic strain uh, will uh, increase uh, the longer uh, uh, that this uh, contraction continues. Uh, and as we have seen the situation evolve, uh, our of the, of the and length of the contraction uh, has continued to uh, expand. Uh, at the moment, the level of uncertainty around uh, how this will evolve uh, is so great uh, you know, that I, I would not want to uh, uh, predict uh, how it will evolve. Uh, I think we need to ensure that uh, particularly our financial institutions are resilient uh, to a variety of ways in which this could evolve, given the current level of uncertainty. Uh, but they are very strong. Uh, they entered this uh, crisis uh, in a position of uh, strong capital, strong liquidity, uh, and they have filled an important role in responding to the crisis. Uh, and so that's an advantage to begin. Thank you. I now go to committee staff, members in order. Thank you, Chairman Meeks. Um, Mr. Lutzenmeyer, you will now have three minutes for your question. Thank you, and I uh, just want to thank the panelists for being here today, and I want to uh, appreciate, uh, make a comment with regards to uh, Cecil. Uh, each of you, uh, Mr. Hood, you mentioned it in your opening remarks, you to try and ask Basley to have a permanent exception. Now the Fed, Comptroller, and FDIC, um, I think March the 24th, 26th, had a, a joint uh, interim rule that said you want to uh, postpone it for another two years and delay it, uh, implement it, and implementation for another three. 
we thank you for recognizing the, the disaster that Cecil is. And while I don't want to say I told you so, I told you so. Um, with regards to my opening remarks with regards to the forbearance, I think it's going to be vitally important that each of you be able to transmit to your your staffs, your other regulators and you, how important it's going to be to have forbearance. Otherwise, we're going to have, in my estimation, a reoccurrence of an auto and nine with regards to the regulators going in and classifying entire lines of business, forcing them out of the bank. And as a result, you destroy the businesses, you destroy the jobs, and you destroy the local economies. We'll never get our economy back on track if we start without forbearance for the bank. To that end, I have a bill that I'm working on to try and do that, where we put the impaired assets into a separate account on the balance sheet, give it about a year and a half to two years worth of forbearance, and gives you the tool to be able to work with the banks to, to give them time to get these assets back up and running again, and gives the banks time to also reserve instead of immediately, they can reserve over a period of time. So I like your reaction. Uh, each of you mentioned flexibility in your opening remarks. Can you, uh, Ms. Williams, I know we talked about this before, how are you going to impart onto your staffs the need for and execute forbearance with your with your member with your examiners? Thank you for that question. We have done extensive outreach both with banks, uh, state regulators, and our uh, commissioned examiners. Uh, we have had webinars internally to make sure that this new framework that we have in place, where whereby loans that are modified for the purposes of the pandemic are not classified as CDRs, and I, I'll tell you this: one of the uh, greatest accomplishments I think we have had with that statement that we issued was getting PASB to agree with us that modifying loans for the purposes of the COVID-19 pandemic does not constitute a CDR. And then now the job is on us to make sure that our examiners implement that. So we have engaged uh, and we're training our examiners to make sure that. They're looking at these loans that are modified that are in, in, in the interest of both the bank and the customer are not uh, being mistreated uh, in our review uh, and looked upon as PDRs when they shouldn't be. Well, I appreciate that. I know that in the last several months here, when we've done the PPP program, it's important that we have certainty for the banks. I think a new law versus guidance, which can be interpreted or misinterpreted by everybody, uh, is the way to go. So thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. We will now go to Ms. Waters. You're uh, now uh, acknowledged for three minutes for your question. To thank all of our panelists uh, who are with us today. Vice Chair Qualls, community lenders, especially minority depository institutions and community development financial institutions have been an important conduit for loans to a wide range of consumers, small businesses and minority owned businesses, and underserved communities especially. This is why I fought to ensure that they have a meaningful chance to participate in programs, the Paycheck Protection Act and the Main Street Lending Program. The Fed should be proactively inclusive of MDIs and CDFIs, including non-bank CDFIs, and the Fed should raise awareness in underserved communities so that small and diverse businesses can benefit. This program should be run transparently so we promptly know who is lending the money and who is getting the money. Vice Chair Quarles, will the Fed track and publish regular updates on what size and kinds of lenders are lending to the Main Street loans? Lending the Main Street loans. Uh, Yes, we will. Vice Chair Qualls, last Friday, the SBA's Inspector General urged the SBA to issue guidance to PPP lenders, requiring them to prioritize bars in underserved markets and to collect optional demographic information on the application. Will the Fed do the same for the Main Street Lending Program? Uh, well, we will uh, uh, we will certainly supervise the Main Street Lending Program uh, and the lenders that are involved in it to ensure that they are uh, complying with the law uh, and that they're lending fairly as well as well. Thank you. Now, most small businesses don't need a loan for five hundred thousand or more. Will the Fed eliminate this unnecessary barrier to help more small businesses? 
Well, as we look at the structure of assistance programs that uh, have been uh, established, uh, the PPP program uh, is for the smallest firms. Uh, the Main Street Lending Program is for the mid-sized firms, and then our corporate credit uh, facilities are for the largest firms. Uh, and we have lowered the uh, uh, minimum loan size for the Main Street Lending Program and uh, but we are still, I think that the system as a whole will operate best if we try to ensure that each uh, facility and each uh, response uh, is targeted to uh, Look, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Qualls. I just want you to know uh, that Main Street, as I understand it, is supposed to be for medium and small. And if it's for small also, they should be able to obtain, uh, you know, the loans and not have a $500,000 requirement in order to participate. Thank you. And we're certainly open to considering additional evolution. The Main Street program will continue to evolve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Waters. I will now turn to Mr. McHenry for three minutes for his question. Well, thank you. And uh, I want to thank all of you for taking the time with, uh, with the committee. Um, it's informative and helpful. Um, so, uh, Vice Chair Corals, I'd like to go to you. Um, last week, I, I sent a letter to uh, all the financial regulators that we have oversight over uh, as a committee, and I encouraged them uh, to finalize uh, a number of rule makings as quickly as possible, uh, regulatory changes as quickly as possible in light of the choppy economic waters that we're certainly in. Uh, to that end, uh, Chair Quarles, in your opinion, how important is regulatory right sizing uh, for our economic recovery? And what additional regulatory reforms do you think we need to help stimulate economic growth in a, in a smart, thoughtful way? Uh, well, so I, I do think that it's important that we think uh, about the contribution of the regulatory framework uh, to ensuring that we're supporting uh, the economy currently. Uh, some of those uh, can be uh, in the form of targeted and temporary changes that we've proposed such as, or implemented, such as uh, changes to the uh, supplemental leverage ratio. Uh, others uh, we have been uh, developing for some time, uh, and they can be uh, supportive of the economy uh, generally as well. And uh, I think that where that's consistent with the uh, crisis response uh, responsibilities that we have, we should uh, continue to move forward with uh, with those efforts. Thank you. Uh, what I would commend to all of you as regulators is that in these unprecedented times, I think uh, the American people want to see our institutions of government move competently and effectively. Uh, you all have had uh, quite a full plate of regulatory changes you're attempting to make. I think it's important you fulfill those responsibilities that you have. Uh, to see those things through and to take necessary measures related to the current crisis. And so I would encourage you to keep moving and moving quickly, even though we have uh, a, a workforce that is uh, widely distributed at the moment. I think it's incumbent that we uh, incumbent upon us to show that we can act smartly and judiciously in these unprecedented times. To that end, I've also uh, uh, sent a letter to uh, the Fed, the FDIC, and the OCC related to cybersecurity threats uh, to regulators and to the financial institutions. And I'd encourage you to be mindful of those, thing those things as well. Thank you for taking time here, and uh, and I am uh, that that completes my questions. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. I will now go to Ms. Velasquez for three minutes for her question. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman Cole, the Fed's uh, municipal liquidity facility is designed to support lending to states, municipalities, and other entities. However, when designing the facility, the Fed completely excluded all the U.S. territories, including Puerto Rico, from participation despite Congress' inclusion of the territories as an eligible participant in the program under the CARES Act. Can you please explain to me why Puerto Rico and the other territories 
were excluded by the Fed? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so the Fed facilities, including the uh, municipal facility, are principally designed uh, to help entities that uh, are having a cash flow problem uh, because of the crisis uh, and therefore can uh, take on uh, appropriate debt in order to- Sir, I know that. Excuse me. Can you please explain to me why Puerto Rico and the U.S. were not included? Yeah, yes, ma'am, that is what I'm doing. Uh, and and there, the the uh, territories uh, are their problems really uh, are not a COVID-induced uh, uh, cash flow issue, uh, and it's not clear that their position would be their position would probably be if they were to take. Uh, and so we, you know, again, uh, I don't know. I'm losing you. Yeah, out here. Yeah. Uh, I, can you can you hear me now? Hello. Now. Okay. Uh, uh, so the uh, the concern that we'd have would be if the territories were to take on a substantial amount of additional debt, but that's not going to improve their situation. Uh, instead, oh, there are a variety of other programs. I, I heard you. Need. Can you please answer to me? What data do you have uh, to make? such a statement or a comment that the situation in the territories were not related to COVID-19? Well, certainly uh, the situation in the territory of COVID-19. The question is, will the response uh, of, of, of uh, their taking on additional debt improve their situation or should uh, other programs, such as the PROMESA program that uh, Puerto Rico uh, participates in, the FEMA programs that are available for the territories, which provide forgivable grants, uh, are those uh, better tools to address their situation? Uh, and I think they probably are, rather than loading them up with additional debt. Are you willing to update um, your plan in the near future to include the territories? You know, they are our colonies, and Congress intent was to include the territories. Well, we're always open to additional input and data uh, with respect to all of the facilities. Uh, but I do think that that question of whether additional debt for them is the right thing for them is an important uh, principle to keep in mind. Are you Thank you. Are you Thank you, Ms. Velasquez. Mr. Barr, I will now uh, turn it over to you for, for three minutes for your question. Uh, first question is to uh, Chair McWilliams, and, and thanks uh, to the rank uh, to uh, Chairwoman Waters for hosting this. Um, Chair McWilliams, uh, I was pleased to see that the FDIC announced yesterday a proposed rule to mitigate the effects of a bank's participation in EDP uh, with respect to assessment for deposit insurance premiums. Uh, beyond this, uh, what government is the FDIC planning to supervision to ensure that banks do not receive adverse treatment for their participation in the belief programs that Congress authorized through, through the CARES Act. Thank you for that question, Congressman. Uh, we are working hard to make sure that the policies we are implementing on the regulatory side side uh, get uh, uh, translated and, frankly, implemented on the supervisory side as well. And as, as you can imagine, some of the now, um, our, our departure from the from the things we have done in the past in terms of how we're looking at trouble debt restructuring and how we're going to look at some of the other uh, actions we have taken on the regulatory side because we want to do what we can and provide utmost flexibility for banks to modify these laws for the consumers. This is really with the consumer uh, in mind. Uh, we know that during the 2008 crisis, banks uh, ran into a lot of problems on the accounting and regulatory side trying to modify loans for the consumers, and even in cases where the banks wanted to modify the, the, the loans and the consumers were asking for the loans to be modified, they couldn't. So we're making sure that our examiners are aware of what needs to be done and how to look at these new portfolios, because this is going to be a different approach than we have taken in 2008. And it is all done with the goal of making sure that banks go out and lend to the economy, that they are modifying these laws, and they're they are available to their customers and consumers. Well, thank you, thank you. And and uh, as uh, 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 Ranking Member Luke Tamara pointed out, there's going to be a need, need to be a lot of uh, forbearance uh, by the examiners, given 
uh, everything that the government has put on the banks, particularly as you look at the PPP uh, program and, and lenders' uh, management of that now that they have them on their books. Uh, last question I'd like to ask uh, is to um, Mr. Quarles. Um, Vice Chair Quarles, uh, I'm a, a little concerned about what I'm hearing in commercial real estate, especially uh, retail and shopping centers. Um, the PPP and Main Street program is uh, not supporting rent payments, uh, which place it, which places considerable pressure on commercial real estate owners. Uh, I, I'd like to for you to comment on whether you believe uh, TALF can be accessed to forestall foreclosures or whether you're considering an additional liquidity facility that would unlock the commercial uh, mortgage market and allow CMBS servicers to provide forbearance to commercial property owners? Uh, we're not uh, currently considering a facility, uh, and uh, we are monitoring the situation uh, closely. Uh, as you state, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, you know, there are significant strains there, uh, and if those continue to develop, uh, you know, we'll, we will consider the appropriate response. We aren't currently considering an additional facility. My time has expired, but that, that's a time sensitive issue. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Mr. Scott, I will now turn it over to you for three minutes for questions. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman Charles, you said one of the goals of the uh, Federal Reserve's municipal uh, uh, liquidity facility was to enable states to borrow directly and then lend downstream to smaller localities with too small populations to access the municipal facility directly. Uh, however, my state of Georgia has a constitutional impediment that prevents us from engaging in downstream lending. I want to call that to your attention. Perhaps you have something that you could do to help the states. And let me go quickly to uh, Ms. McWilliams. Uh, Ms. McWilliams, uh, concerning the, um, um, the um, your efforts, the fact that right now we have over 30 million Americans without jobs, their families, their homes are approaching foreclosure. Many of them already uh, foreclosed on. So, Ms. Waters, myself, and our colleagues are working on a $75 billion tranche in this package to assist 50 states and the, and the territories of uh, Puerto Rico, the District of Columbia, Guam, and the Virgin Islands to help make sure that uh, they're not foreclosed on. The money goes directly to the states. If you remember, the FDIC was a partner with the financial crisis we had early, and it was called Hardest Hit. Uh, and it was very helpful in stabilizing the economy. And I want to make sure that aware of that and that you all will be in and helping us to get the money and be able to um, help make sure the students be simple and save our financial system. This is key. But first to you, um, uh, Ms. Quarles, what about that? My state can't do it because of the constitutional impediments. What can we do for that? And uh, to you, Ms. Uh, Meg Williams, we want to make sure you're there as you were as partners working with the banking system to make sure that that money gets from the state to the banks and be able to save our economy from this part. Uh, well, thank you. Well, we uh, are continuing to look at uh, administrative issues associated with the municipal, municipal facility uh, in order to ensure that it can work effectively. Uh, the, the strategy is to lend to the, to the uh, sort of the, uh, larger jurisdictions uh, in order to, to provide for speed of deployment uh, and uh, so that uh, we don't have to develop the administrative infrastructure to deal with all 50,000 uh, local uh, jurisdictions of various sorts around the country. 
Uh, but as issues like yours are raised, we're definitely taking uh, input about that and considering how we can uh, uh, continue to evolve the administration to ensure that the aid can be effective. And Thank you, Mr. Scott. We will now go to Mr. Tipkin for three minutes for his question. Uh, well, I'd like to th thank the panel for taking the time to be able to be with us today. And uh, I'd like to start with Chair McWilliams. I noted your response yesterday to Senator Moran regarding broker deposits. Do you think that now would be an appropriate time for Congress to be able to swap out the current broker uh, deposit regime for an asset load gap? Um, I believe that whenever you can act on this, it would be the, the, the good time because, frankly, banks are getting penalized for um, their inability to uh, engage uh, with uh, broker deposits if uh, they are uh, in, in certain conditions. Um, and it's not the best way necessarily to look at the, at the banks or at their ability to uh, increase deposits on the broker side. So I would I would suggest that if you I would recommend I would I would um, ask that if you have an opportunity to give us more flexibility, and um, at how we look at broker deposits that uh, you you, you uh, act within your jurisdiction as much as you can uh, to provide that authority for us. Great, thank you. And uh, you know in Colorado there's growing anxiety on a lot of our financial institutions about the impacts of PPP loans and Treasury's guidance on forgiveness is restrictive or is unworkable for in terms of uh, This question really for the entire panel. I know that each of your agencies has put out uh, reactive guidance in regards to PPP, but have you all engaged in terms of proactive thinking about the potential problems created down the line by not giving PPP loans? Has the FSOC uh, discussed the potential issues. Chair McWilliams, would you like to start? Did that question come through? Yeah, Alan, I think he asked you to start. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. For on my end, the question was breaking up a little bit. Could you please, I'm sorry, repeat the question real quick. Yeah, it was just in terms of being proactive in terms of thought in regards to the PPE loan forgiveness. Has the FSOC uh, actually discussed this as a potential issue going forward for the economy? We have, we have on an interagency basis discussed how exactly we would treat PPP loans. We know there's a lot of uncertainty. We know that banks are concerned about liability issues that may attach to those loans. The intent of Congress here was to get these loans out to the consumers and the public and the businesses as soon as possible. And we have encouraged banks to do so, and we will continue to think about any potential liability issues or any obstacles that may be in the way of banks being able to act as a vehicle here and as a conduit to congressional action. Jerry Quarles. Uh, yes, I can quickly con uh, I can quickly confirm that uh, we have been working on an interagency basis to uh, uh, to address that issue in the way that Elena described. Okay. This is Ron. I, well, I was just wanting to concur that we at NCRA are also working with some of the same issues that FDIC has identified. We are encouraging our credit unions to be active supporters of lending to our main street businesses, and we've also issued guidance around how the risk rated treatments of those loans should be taken into consideration on credit union uh, balance sheets. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Tipton. Mr. Clay, I will now turn it over to you for three minutes for your question. Oh, thank you so much. Let me thank Chairman Meeks as well as Ranking Member Lukemeyer uh, for our first uh, round table. Let me start with Mr. Qualls. Um, now that the Federal Reserve has opened up the PPP liquidity facility to all PPP lenders, including non-banks, how many non-banks have utilized the facility to date? And what steps is the Fed proactively taking to ensure non-bank CDFIs, for example, are able to fully utilize the facility? Uh, 
Uh, well, there are approximately 80 uh, non-depository CDFIs that are eligible uh, to use the facility. Now, these facilities are in their uh, very uh, early days of being stood up and operating all of the facilities. Uh, and so I don't have the figures uh, for you today on the uh, uh, exact number that have taken advantage of it. Uh, but I will uh, certainly be able to get those uh, to you. Uh, but there are 80 non-bank CDFIs that are eligible. Well, thank you for that, and hopefully you can get us that information when it starts to come in. Let me move to Mr. Hood real quick. Um, Mr. Hood, credit union customers, including consumers and small businesses, are facing numerous challenges. Uh, what steps is NCUA taking to ensure that credit unions provide flexibility, for those customers, including providing forbearance, waiving fees, and ensuring and ensuring that uh, no harm is done to these people when they apply for a loan, can you go over some of that with me? Yes, sir. Thank you for your question. First and foremost, sir, I'd like to inform you that the NCUA during the pandemic has reaffirmed its long-standing practice of encouraging credit unions to work constructively with their borrowers and member owners who are experiencing financial hardship. So please know that we at NCUA are encouraging those credit unions to adopt prudent loan modifications to look at deferment of payments and easing credit terms in a safe and sound manner to improve uh, the prospects of a repayment of a loan. My written testimony lists a lot of the letters that we've sent, interagency statements, guidance and press releases that, that repeat this message. But the one message I'd also like to share the guidance that we're sending to our examiners is that they are to hold no such efforts against the credit unions that work with those borrowers and get paid to restructure their loans. We want them to know that there will be no actions held against them during the prudent loan modifications that are being made during the time of this pandemic. Well, I, I thank you for that response and thank the uh, NCUA for their diligence and ability to work with their customers. And, um, um, I'm, my time is up, so thank you. And, and, sir, I have been calling credit unions in your area, and I'm proud to report that many of those small credit unions to whom I've spoken are participating in a lot of our modification efforts, but also making PPP loans. Very good. Thank you, sir. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Uh, I will now go to Mr. Williams. You are now acknowledged for three minutes for your question. Well, thank you very much. It's good to uh, see everybody back doing the work we need to be doing. I want to thank leadership for putting this call together. You know, spending trillions of dollars is not a sustainable way to try to get an economy back on track. Uh, we need to look for regulatory fixes and legislative solutions that will help stimulate the economy without breaking the bank. Uh, some of the largest banks already have uh, in-house uh, uh, capabilities to deliver their banking services, but many smaller community banks do not have the budgets to deliver. And uh, consumers have expectations and behavior, and we need to we need to work with that. So, uh, Chairman McWilliams, back in December, uh, you spoke at the Brookings Institute broker deposits in the FinTech Age event. You stated that a cap on asset growth within financially troubled institutions would be far easier uh, regime for the FDIC to administer, and would more directly address the current statute's original intent uh, to prevent troubled institutions from using insured deposits to try to grow their way out of the financial challenges. So what my question would be is uh, I'm going to be pushing for a legislative fix with the framework you addressed in your Brookings Institute remarks so community banks can compete on a level playing field with the big guys. We are short on time, so Chairman Williams, I just wanted to get a simple yes or no answer. Would you be able uh, or would you be supportive if an asset growth cap on troubled institutions was included in the future COVID-19 legislation. You touched on that a little bit earlier. Correct. Um, yes, um, to the extent that it's uh, um, in lieu of the current restrictions on broker deposits, yes. Okay. Uh, now, before I yield back, I wanted to give some credit where credit is due. Uh, Vice Chairman Quarles, you know I have been critical of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors in the past and have often urged you to not agree in some of their regulatory proposals that I think wouldn't fit our American insurance system. 
However, IAIS came out and said it would be devastating to retroactively alter business interruption insurance policies to cover COVID-19 related losses. Uh, I totally agree and have uh, to commend them uh, on those statements and give them praise when they get something right. So I hope you uh, continue to share their position uh, on the issue because uh, like we say in Texas, a deal is a deal. So would you, do you stand the same way? Uh, yes, well, thank you for that question. And, and the FSB and the IAIS work closely together on those issues. Uh, and uh, uh, that position is one. Uh, well, we haven't at the Fed uh, given direct consideration to it because it's largely outside of our purview. Uh, uh, the IAS uh, is coordinating with the FSB and issuing that view. Well, we appreciate it. I think it's good that it's a good position to be in. So I appreciate the work. I appreciate all of you being on the on the call today, and I yield my time back. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. Heck, I will now turn over to you for three minutes for questions. Thank you. Mr. Quarles, first, I'd like to extend my appreciation to you and the rest of the members at the Fed for the aggressive actions they've taken to try to prevent this economy from falling into a second Great Depression. Thank you, sir. Uh, secondly, I'd like to associate myself, at least to some degree, with the remarks of my friend, uh, Congressman Andy Barr, regarding the plight and future of commercial real estate. Here's how I see this. Uh, there are a whole bunch of restaurants, there are a whole bunch of hotels, there are a whole bunch of retailers that are going to fail. And there's no amount of getting around that, frankly. That is eventually what is going to happen, unfortunately. Uh, and when they do, those tenants are going to stop paying the property owners. And when they do, the property owners are going to have a difficult time paying the banks. And when that happens, by the way, when the situation at the banks becomes more difficult, uh, then the people that are the most vulnerable, uh, and the highest risk for banks are likeliest to be uh, the first victims of that. Last in, first out, mm -hmm. as they say. So in response to Mr. Meek's question about this risk going forward, you said, there is a risk. We don't know how big. We're monitoring it. I guess my question is, isn't there something more than mon monitoring that the regulators should be doing or preparing for uh, if my projection is accurate and we're going to have severe stress in this part of the economy because it will have a significant domino effect? Uh, well, uh, monitoring is not uh, uh, a, uh, a passive or, uh, uh, or casual activity. We are in the process uh, right now of uh, conducting the stress tests on our largest institutions, uh, which uh, will include sensitivity analyses that take into account projections of the uh, possible outcomes of the current event, uh, both with respect to uh, potential commercial real estate losses, as well as a broad variety of other potential uh, losses uh, in existing assets and new assets that may come on. Uh, again, there, while there's a great deal of uncertainty around that, I think we owe it uh, to the country in order to make the uh, most careful data-driven granular analysis we can of the current resilience of the financial industry in light of uh, potential outcomes of this event, uh, and then make decisions based on that. We are continuing to conduct the stress test. Uh, I believe we'll be able to have the results uh, on an accelerated basis faster than we typically have them each year, which is usually towards the end of June. I think they'll be available faster than that so that we can uh, make these decisions uh, promptly with the best data available. And does that mean, Mr. Quarles, that with that best data available, if there are alarm signs and the amber light is glowing, if not flashing, that you will also develop plans of action for us to deal with this? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Purpose of the I, I don't yield back because that's inappropriate, but I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Heck. Mr. Laramilk, I will now turn it over to you for three minutes for questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think I finally got unmuted here. Um, Mr. Quarles, I know we don't have a whole lot of time in this uh, this forum, but I appreciate all the work that uh, the Fed has done in, on the liquidity facilities. But last month, uh, 14 bipartisan members of this committee sent a letter to the Fed asking that the term uh, asset-backed security loan facility, TALF, be expanded to include securities made up of unsecured 
consumer loans, which are typically made by fintech companies partnering with banks or credit unions. There's been some news articles over the last few days claiming that TALF is a bailout and that these loans are unregulated, which could not be further from the truth. Um, the TALF will provide liquidity to investors, which must be fully repaid, and these consumer loans are well regulated on both the federal and state level. So my question is, what are your thoughts on including the securities which are backed by consumer loans as eligible co collateral for TALF? I think it may still be muted. I'm so sorry. That's the that uh, the the sound has varied some, but that's the first time I have failed to unmute myself in two months. Um, <laughs> you, uh, 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 I was so eager to answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are continuing uh, uh, to look at the issue of uh, uh, consumer finance uh, 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 under TALF, um, uh, as with all the facilities. Uh, enrolling them out initially, we've tried to balance uh, deployment. Existing uh, that have uh, to ensure that they can be deployed effectively, with getting input on how they can be further refined. And this is an issue uh, that we are getting a lot of input on. It's an important issue that you've underlined. Uh, we are looking at it. We haven't made a final decision either to reject or accept. Uh, and we'd be happy to continue to keep you apprised as we work through this. Well, I, I'd appreciate it, is, is doing it as expeditiously as you can because, as you know, there's a lot of businesses. They're getting to that point of where they have to make some critical decisions of going forward. And a lot of times, these these financial institutions they actually help some of the most vulnerable consumers out there. And so, I appreciate uh, moving as quickly as as you can on that. Uh, Chairman McWilliams, real quickly, um, small dollar loans. There, they were at four. Uh, into this crisis, they're growing now, and I just think that banks and credit unions should be able to make these uh, small dollar consumer loans. Absolutely, and I believe that uh, being able to uh, secure a small dollar loan to a bank provides more choices for the consumer, which is generally good in terms of the pricing of these loans. Um, and also gives us an opportunity on the regulatory side to implement consumer protection laws to the fullest extent to make sure that the communities are well served but also protected. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you, Mr. Larum Milt. Mr. Foster, I will now turn it to you for three minutes for your question. Well, thank you. And I'd like to thank our chairman, ranking member, and panelists here today. Uh, Vice Chair Corals, um, I saw that you recently released the pricing methodology for the municipal bonds that will be purchased by the SPV. The pricing, frankly, looks rather expensive. Looks rather expensive. Uh, muni bonds with investment grade ratings will carry spreads as high as 380 basis points. Uh, so my question is, how did you arrive at that pricing? Is it risk based, or are there other considerations? And is this comparable to the pricing at which you will be purchasing corporate bonds of comparable risk under the primary corporate credit facility? Uh, yes. Well, uh, all of our facilities are intended to provide a uh, backstop uh, to uh, private finance where that's available. That will achieve the best uh, if they uh, if they capitalize uh, private finance as opposed. Private finance. Uh, as a consequence, um, uh, we uh, can price them uh, uh, somewhat higher at the time of issuance uh, uh, in order to uh, in order to achieve that objective. Uh, so it's not uh, principally the price is not driven principally by the risk involved, but to ensure that the facility is perfect. Uh, the price may look high now uh, because the market has healed a lot uh, in the past few weeks, uh, in part because of the announcement of the availability of this backstop. Yeah, well, there there are still issues that I have having to do with uh, long-standing issues having to do with uh, muni bond pricing and and credit ratings uh, versus corporate bonds. Where if it was an apples to apples uh, risk-based pricing you'd get very different results. And, and the result of this is, of course, that the municipalities and so on are struggling, um, you know, have been struggling for years with a higher, 
higher rate than you know I think they should be paying. And also, um, it's a particularly an issue now. Um, now, do you feel that you have the legislative authority to lower that rate uh, for muni bonds if it is if necessary uh, by using the funds that are already appropriated by Congress through the CARES Act? Um, yes, I would say that the the uh, question of uh, setting the rate is not a question of the legislative. It is a question of trying to ensure that we structure each of the facilities, not just in the to ensure that they achieve that, that role of being a backstop for private finance as opposed to a substitute for private finance. Uh, we make those, uh, again, judgments at the time uh, that the facility is rolled out. The relationship of that uh, pricing will vary uh, then uh, as the market changes. And because the market has improved uh, materially for uh, many municipal, uh, uh, the municipal market has improved materially over the last while, uh, the pricing may seem higher than originally, but that's actually uh, uh, a, uh, an indication of the success of the facility. Okay, thank you and uh, for the time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Budd. I will now turn it over to you for three minutes for your question. Thank you. And, and Vice Chair Quarles, I just want to confirm that you can hear me okay? I can hear you quite clearly. I hope you can hear me. I've been told I've been a little spotty sometimes. <laughs> uh, same here. Um, so, uh, Vice Chair Quarles, some in Congress have suggested, and I've heard this in other places quite prominently, that we should force insurers to pay for COVID-19 business interruption claims that weren't really built into the policies uh, before the pandemic. Um, now, the IAIS says that such a move would significantly undermine the ability of insurers to pay other types of claims not related to COVID-19 and ultimately threaten policyholder protection and financial stability uh, of the insurance market. So I agree with IAIS on this, and uh, I led a letter on the issue. A lot of the members that are on this call signed onto this with me. Um, and Treasury even stated, while insurers should pay valid claims, uh, we share your concerns, my concerns, that these proposals are fundamentally conflict with the contractual nature of insurance obligations and could introduce stability issues or, or risks to the industry. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you agree with that? And uh, love to hear your, your take on this. Uh, well, thanks for that question. Um, so, uh, you know, in my capacity here for the Federal Reserve, you know, the Fed is not an insurance regulator, and, and so uh, we haven't taken a position uh, on that question uh, directly. Um, uh, in my role uh, as chairman of the FSB, the FSB does work closely with the IAIS uh, in developing these issues that can have financial stability implications, and obviously the the uh, solvency of the insurance industry globally has those uh, implications. And, and that, uh, I think that view by that standard setter, you know, it, it has been reached uh, in a process that's uh, consistent with FSB processes and it's appropriate to take. Uh, very good. Um, I think there was a pause there. Uh, I heard, I'm hearing about 80% of everything you're saying. Um, is the FSOC looking at this? I heard FSB, but is FSOC, and, and pardon me if I'm overlapping with what you've already answered, but is FSOC looking at this in terms of the negative impact on financial stability? Uh, so the FSOC has not uh, discussed it uh, directly um, uh, at, the, at the principal's level, but, the, uh, uh, but it is an issue that uh, on an interagency basis, uh, the the SOC members certainly are considering. Very good. Uh, thank you, Vice Chairman. If you continue to keep an eye on that, we don't want to introduce uh, additional risks into uh, policies, especially ones that ones that weren't already calculated in uh, beforehand. So uh, thanks for your time and for being on the call today. Thank you, Mr. Budd. This will be our last question. Ms. Talib, you have three minutes for your question. If not, I will go to Ms. Porter for three minutes for her question.
not, I'll go to Miss uh, Mr. McAdams for three minutes. This will be our last member for questions. Thank you. I'm here. Thank you, um, Mr. Thank you. My question would be for uh, Vice Chair Quarles as well regarding the corporate credit facilities. So, can you walk us through how the Fed or the investment manager that the Fed retained, I believe that was BlackRock, uh, makes decisions about which corporate bonds the Fed decides to purchase through the primary or secondary corporate credit facilities? And is everyone eligible by the term sheet, or is there additional underwriting criteria that the Fed is using in addition to that term sheet? Uh, so, uh, we can, in addition to the term sheet that you have, we've added uh, uh, that we're buying uh, ETFs now, a broad, uh, a broad index. Uh, I think it's important to note uh, that the uh, underwriting criteria are set uh, by the Treasury and the Federal Reserve. Uh, the uh, investment manager that's hired really is uh, purely an administrative agent uh, and, and does not make any of the uh, uh, policy decisions uh, or underwriting decisions around the execution of that uh, facility. Uh, we uh, use credit ratings uh, in order to determine who is eligible and and we will generally, you know, the facility will generally lend to all those who meet the term sheet criteria. And do you anticipate holding these investments for the life of the purchase bonds or do you anticipate them uh, selling them at a date, at a date TBD? Uh, our intention is to buy and hold. Okay. Uh, and can you, uh, I realize that this uh, process is being developed. We commend you on, on the work you've done and, and, and notice that already just uh, the prospect of this has, has created some liquidity in the market. So it appears to be having the desired impact. Um, what, what, trans, what level of transparency do you believe is appropriate on those terms so that uh, the American public can better understand how and why the Fed is making various investment decisions well we're endeavor on the terms uh, of the facilities we're endeavoring to be uh, uh, quite transparent uh, I, I think that's uh, quite appropriate we've got monthly disclosures that will be coming of the borrowers of the amounts that are borrowed uh, uh, in many cases the 13 three facilities uh, under the, the structure of the transparency structure that Congress created, uh, would not be subject to some of these required disclosures, uh, but we are going to uh, make them uh, because we do think that transparency is important. We have a deep commitment to uh, uh, public transparency and accountability for our actions. Thank you. Appreciate that response. Uh, with that, I, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Meeks. I will now turn it back over to you for your closing remarks. Now, Mr. Luca, I'll yield one minute first to Mr. Luca Maya. If he has a Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank our, our guests for being here today. Um, very informative. Appreciate your uh, approach to this, this pandemic. Uh, all of you have got big jobs to do with regards to continuing to, to protect our economy, to enable our um, people to and businesses to live their lives and, and get back to normal. And we want to be a partner with you in that. Uh, we believe that we need to work together to be able to foster a, a good environment for our economy to come back in. And whatever we can do, uh, let me know. I want to be there to be helpful, to be able to get things back up and running. And again, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for putting this together, and I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lucamayo. I want to thank everyone for their participation today and thank our panel for their contributions to this discussion. Unfortunately, barely a decade removed from the financial crisis, we are once again living through a historic dark times on par with the Great Depression. It is critical and urgent that we all work together as members of Congress and with the administration to protect our financial sector, which entered this crisis with strong reserves and a robust regulatory framework from strain or collapse under the pressures of an extended crisis. Healthy banks and credit unions are key to averting a systemic crisis to ensuring that American families and small business continue to have access to credit and help lay the foundation for a strong recovery. I look forward to working with all of you in achieving these goals, protecting this great economy from further harm, and offering families across this great nation, our constituents and our neighbors, the support they deserve as we weather this storm together. 
Thank you all for participating in today's roundtable, which is now concluded.